Continuing on with our food safety, we're looking at bacteria in this video. Looking at some possible bacteria that get you sick, how they get you sick, and then how to keep them out of getting you sick if possible. Bacteria. We're looking at a couple different bacterial samples, but this is only a small amount because there's tons of bacteria that can impact food safety. So the ones we're looking at are just going to be more along the lines of the more common types that you can see. Let's start off with Salmonella. Now, Salmonella is very commonly found in birds, reptiles, even some mammals' intestines. That means since it's commonly found in birds, a lot of your poultry, think chicken, turkey, those can have salmonella with the meat. That's why it's important to cook the meat thoroughly to the recommended temperatures. Eggs can even have salmonella as well. Anything that comes from a bird could potentially be infected. Symptom-wise, they start about 12 hours in up to about 72 hours. So that's the kind of window when things would start. And it can last for anywhere from four to seven days. The symptoms themselves, looking at fever, diarrhea, and intestinal cramping as the most common problems. Now, usually for salmonella poisoning, you don't usually need to get medical treatment unless it becomes severe. Now, I say severe, that's more along the lines of extreme cramping, consistent diarrhea for days, and the dehydration is becoming an issue. Or if someone is immunocompromised. In that case, there's a more higher chance of becoming more severe. Next one up is Listeria mousitogenes. In Listeria mousitogenes, this one is kind of unique because it can actually grow while in the refrigerator. So even though you're keeping it cool in the fridge like you should, it still has the ability to grow in that cooler environment. Now, Listeria mousitogenes is going to cause the infection listeriosis. You find this a lot of times in lunch meats, soft cheeses, and seafood is the most common places to find this. Now, typically it only impacts very young children or those that are immunocompromised. Reason being, older children, adults, they typically have enough of an immune system to not allow this Listeria mousitogenes to take hold. But if an infection does occur, looking at fever, looking at nausea, vomiting, even headaches are part of this. So that's Listeria mousitogenes. Shifting on to the third one. This one probably is the most common one you hear of most often. You, a lot of times you hear this as part of recalls of different food. We're looking at Escherichia coli, or E. coli as it's known. Now, E. coli has many different strains out there. And a lot of times the strains are just a series of letters and numbers. So we're not getting to what they are. But know that in the case of E. coli, normally you can have some E. coli found in your intestines. They're there because they're part of your normal bacterial flora. They help you stay healthy and they're supposed to be there. Problems arise when you get a different pathogenic strain. Now, these pathogenic strains are cause upset stomach, can cause a whole series of problems. But where do you find these pathogenic strains? The most common place is meat. Think beef, cows. Because you find E. coli regularly in cows' intestines. And the E. coli they have is sometimes pathogenic for the ones we have. You can also find it in unpasteurized milk. Makes sense from cows and even leafy greens. I'm saying, hold on, they're not going to be growing on the lettuce. No. But the lettuce can be contaminated from the fertilizer. Maybe it was from the manure. Can be contaminated in the handling process. Can be contaminated anywhere along the line. This contamination could add E. coli onto that leafy green. And then if it's not washed properly, that can then enter into your system. So E. coli can come primarily from beef, cows, but can also come from contamination onto leafy green vegetables. 
So a lot of times, a couple days after eating it, one, two, three days after consumption, is when symptoms will start to occur. Water diarrhea is probably the most common one here. You'll have severe cramping. You're going to have the risk of dehydration also occurring. Because with the watery diarrhea comes dehydration in the system. You just can't keep up with fluids. Depending on how severe that dehydration gets, depends if you need medical intervention or not at that point. Now, some of these pathogenic strains of E. coli can actually include what's called a sugar toxin. Now, this sugar toxin can actually be causing even more severe symptoms can impact the urinary tract and cause severe urinary tract infections. This ends up in damage in the kidneys and can even, in extreme cases, be deadly. So it's kind of important to get this figured out and if it is progressing to serious problems, seeking medical intervention. Now that infection of the kidneys and the urinary tract infection, that is the hemolytic uremic syndrome. So that's what we mentioned previously, and that can unfortunately be fatal. So it's one of the things, if this keeps progressing, medical treatment is necessary. So how do you prevent it? Wash the vegetables. By washing your leafy greens or other vegetables, you wash off bacteria. Cooking the meats to the recommended temperature, not undercooking it. Not cross-contaminating, cutting up meat and then cutting your vegetables with the same cutting board or the same knife. So by keeping things separate, can help to reduce the risk of potential contamination and infection. All right, next up, Clostridium botulinum. Now, Clostridium botulinum can cause botulism. So the interesting thing here though is, Clostridium botulinum can actually be used as a medical treatment also. What happens is, it can be used as Botox. Now, you might have heard Botox as the injections that help to reduce wrinkles, but a lot of times there's also medical uses with headaches. Individuals that get severe migraines, Botox, that actual controlled amount, can help to reduce the headaches and the severity. So there is actually a medical benefit to this bacteria and this toxin it produces. But if you ingest the botulism, so clustering botulism, and you end up having a case of botulism, usually 36 to 72 hours after ingestion is when you start to see symptoms. Now the symptoms here are actually paralysis. It'll start with a descending paralysis, moving from up towards the mouth, heading down into the chest and intestines. The reason being it's impacting the nerves and the muscles. The botulin toxin is going to cause the muscles to go into a paralytic state, which means they can't move. So depending on how severe this case is, it can be minor and just having a little bit of paralysis, but it can get major and actually impact the diaphragm. If that happens, breathing becomes labored and very problematic. So the severity of the botulinism could be quite problematic and need medical intervention. Rolling on along, we get into Campylobacter juni. In the case of Campylobacter juni, it's one of the most common causes of diarrhea. Now, it typically infects the upper portion of the small intestines. So, usually you'll find this undercooked chicken. So, going back to chicken again, poultry. So, just like salmonella, we're in the poultry aspect. What happens here now is, if you're undercooking a chicken, or anything else that came into contact with the juice of those chicken. So if you have that chicken breast, you know how some juice comes off it. If that's on a cutting board, then you put some vegetables on there, or you start to work on some other grains or pasta or something, any cross-contamination can also cause an issue. Usually symptoms are about three to six days after exposure. You'll see nausea, cramps, could ink it in some diarrhea here, and again, headaches. This typically is more of a mild case, but it can become severe. And as it gets more and more severe, it can actually become fatal depending on how far it goes. A lot of times it can last for seven to 10 days until it runs its course. 
Shigella. Now, Shigella is the next one we're talking about, and this one's kind of different because it's not usually found in food. The way it ends up in food if it's improperly handled by someone that's already infected. So, well, hold on, okay, how's this work? Shigella follows what's called the fecal oral cycle. That means someone used the bathroom, didn't properly wash their hands or didn't wash their hands at all, and then that was transferred onto the food. This is why if you ever go to a restaurant, you see those employees must wash hand sign. It's trying to make sure that the employees wash their hands and follow proper sanitary procedure before preparing or handling food. Now with Shigella, it's going to need a moist or a liquid environment to survive, which means it's not really gonna survive on dry grains or nuts, but it has to be a moist or a liquid. Once you're exposed, symptoms are one to seven days later. Primarily nausea, vomiting, and fever are the main ones here. But what's interesting here is there's many different species of Shigella that can infect you. Once you've been infected with one species, you're pretty much immune to that species for a period of time. And that's what comes the problem. Because you're immune to that one, if you happen to be infected with it again, you don't even know it. And that's where the contamination can occur, if not washing hands properly. So that's Shigella. Staphylococcus aureus. Now, Staphylococcus aureus is going to be the S a portion of MRSA, M-R-S-A. Now this is only one single strand of it, or one particular strain if you want to say it that way. So it's not all of them, but only one part is what makes up MRSA. So now usually we don't carry Staphylococcus aureus around in our normal flora. So it's not typically found inside the human's intestines. But some can carry Staphylococcus aureus. Now, this one, transmission-wise, is not fecal-oral. So that means, okay, so if someone's carrying it in their intestines, they're not going to transmit fecal-oral. So it's still good to wash your hands, but that's not the way this one works. Normally, Staphylococcus aureus is living in mucous membranes or on the skin. So for example, if somebody sneezes, the mucous membranes of the oral cavity and the lungs could have Staphylococcus aureus. Now, if that sneeze went in someone's hand and then they touch something that you then touched and ate, that now is transmission. That's why it's a lot of times better to sneeze into the elbow. Or if you sneeze in your hands, wash your hands. If you blow your nose, you wash your hands. Preventing that transmission of Staphylococcus aureus. So it's one of those things, it's not a fecal oral, it's a mucous membrane, so sneezing, or some other way of getting something from the mucous membrane out of the body to somebody else. If infected, about eight to 24 hours until you see symptoms. This one primarily with the rest, nausea and vomiting. Usually the size is gone in a day or two. So this is one that's pretty quick turnaround until you start feeling better. Now to wrap up this grouping of bacteria, we have Vibro vulnificus. Now, in the case of Vibro vulnificus, we're looking at a bacteria found in water. So things that could be contaminated could be oysters, for example, shellfish. Now, the interesting part here is it works similar to cholera. Now, this isn't cholera, but it is very similar to the version of cholera. If infected, six hours up into a few days, actually, this could be very quick or hang out for a while before it has symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, cramping the symptoms again. It's a pretty similar there. But this one, if it has underlying health problems, so you were already sick or immunocompromised, it can get very severe very quickly. Now in some rare cases, it can have some extra complications. It can enter into the bloodstream and once in the bloodstream, cause another infection in your blood transferring throughout the whole body. And this also can fall sometimes in the category of a flesh-eating bacteria. So again, it depends on how it works and what you're getting infected with here. So all these bacteria, any one of them, can come from several different sources. 
but thankfully all of them are preventable if proper handling, proper washing, proper cooking are all washed and done. Problem is, unfortunately, not everyone is always followed. So all these bacteria, a few things to know, some things to prevent, and hopefully prevention for the future. Until the next video.